Good to be here this morning. I hear sniffles in the congregation. It's the sniffle time of year. Certain things are high in the air, mold, ragweed, things like that gets to you. Book of Galatians chapter 2. It's good to have everybody here, everybody joining with us online. Got a call this morning from a family that is in India that is watching right now. Good morning, Richard and all your family. So it's good to have you with us this morning. Everybody online, we appreciate you. And we thank God for you. Galatians chapter 2. Um, I, I kind of got ahead of myself last week. I had, I had studied ahead and made notes ahead for chapter 3. Then I realized I wasn't anywhere close to being done with chapter 2. Because last Sunday I asked about what, in your opinion, constitutes witchcraft. And that's the question or that's the issue that Paul brings up in chapter 3 when he says, Who hath bewitched you? And I think the words are there for a reason. I think there was... And I'll explain this a little bit better as we get into it. It won't be today. But when you study the scriptures, you realize that there are two religions in the world. Only two. And Brother Kelly came several years ago and he preached this one time. It really just made me think. And he said there's two religious ideologies in the world. There's only two of them. Two types of religion. And he said, do and done. And he said, our religion is done. Because Christ did it. And he did it all. He was the only one that could. He's the only one that qualified. So we believe then in the finished work of Jesus Christ for our salvation. But then you have the other religion, which is do. And it's always a perpetual doing. You must always do this, always do that. And that's sort of what we were looking at um, earlier when Paul was explaining um, the, different, the differences between the, the, the two ideas of the gospel, whether there's the real gospel, which is Christ has already done it, and then the Jews' religion, which is you must constantly do this, must constantly do that, and so on. And I explained here a couple of weeks ago that the law-keeping religions, Seventh-day Adventist, Hebrew roots, sacred name, and then you, whatever religion there is, you throw that in there, whether it's Buddhism or any of the Eastern religions, there's always a perpetual performance of something that must be maintained in order for you to get whatever blessings there are in heaven. Uh, somebody sent me this article, Catholic Church admits the Seventh-day Adventists are keeping the true Sabbath. Now, what's interesting to me is there is an alliance in Turkana, Kenya against this church and this ministry and it is involves the priest of the catholic church and those of the seventh day adventist religion they both equally hate us the same over there and um, we suspect that a lot of things that have gone against us over there has been the result of both of those groups working against us and so Paul then goes into, in the remainder part of Galatians chapter 2, he goes in, basically says it in no uncertain terms. This is one of the things you look for. If, if let's say you're listening, you, you happen upon a video on YouTube, uh, or a website, or something, something on Facebook, and you, you start listening to somebody, and they're talking about, you know, how Christianity is, you do this or do that, and, and it, you're not sure if they're right or not. What I found is, almost without fail, these law-keeping groups will have 
a Bible study on that focuses on the book of Romans and the book of Galatians. And the reason why is Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews are basically the three books of the New Testament that destroy law-keeping as a form of salvation. They absolutely destroy it. And so what you'll have is you'll have these law-keeping religions sort of twist Galatians and Romans and Hebrews and twist it in such a way as you end up believing that you must keep the law in order to be saved. That's how they do it. In other words, they don't want you just reading Galatians or reading Romans by itself. They want you to listen to their comments on it because they're going to twist it in such a way as to make you think you have to keep the law. So Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Let's start there this morning. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, we can stop right there. I can say class dismissed. Because it means exactly that. And it's not any more complicated than that. A man is not justified by the works of the law. In any way, shape, or form. It doesn't matter what law it is. It doesn't matter what work it is. You are not, you were not, are not, nor will you ever be justified by doing righteousness. Never does that ever happen. Now, let me go off notes here. Turn to Ezekiel 33, and I'll explain... How God sees your works of righteousness. How God views it. Okay? This is, we used to have a version of this when, when I worked for, um, I used to work in drywall and construction, painting, insulation, things like that. And I always liked it when the boss said, attaboy, Mike, which means you did good on something. Okay, but then when the boss came in, looked at something that I did and went, uh-oh. The rule was you could get all the attaboys you want, but if you got one, uh-oh, you were in trouble. That means all your attaboys go flying out the door, okay, and you, you get nothing. So, and it's... and. With about any place you work, they always have some system on how they can terminate you. Doesn't matter how long you work there, if you get so many infractions, if they write you up first time, second time, after the third time, you get fired. Doesn't matter how long you work there, how well you've done, if you get, let's say, three infractions, you're going to get fired from your job. And it's that way, this is what, how God explains it in Ezekiel chapter 33. Um, let's see here, where am I going to look for this here? Look at verse 11, Ezekiel 33, 11. Saying to them, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Now look at verse 12. Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of, the, of thy people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteous, righteousness in the day that he sinneth. Verse 13, when I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live if he trust and underline this, to his own righteousness. If he trust to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousnesses shall not be remembered, but for his iniquity that he has committed, he shall, he shall die for it. So here's, here's, and I got into an argument with a, with a young man who was trying to convince me that if you sin one time after you saved, you're lost again, you must get your salvation back. And I went, no. 
And I took him to Ezekiel 33. I said, it is not by our righteousness that we attain eternal salvation. And Ezekiel 33 explains it. If you, if you are trusting to your own righteousness, doesn't matter before you got saved, after you got saved, if you trust to your own righteousness, God says, if you're going to live that way, fine. The day that you commit one iniquity, all your righteousness is gone. So here's what, and I had, I sat across the table from a guy now, he later repented of this and got saved. But the day that I was talking to him was at his house. And he had learned this from his daddy. He had, his daddy taught him, I believe that when I get to heaven, God's going to take all my good deeds and weigh it up against my bad deeds. That's what he believed. Now, he didn't know that I knew this. But his wife told me that out in their barn... Her husband, this man, had boxes full of dirty magazines. Full of them. And this man, and I knew it. This man was trying to tell me that he believed that whatever good he did in this world would outweigh all of those boxes of that lust that he had hid, that he thought he had hid out from his wife out there in the barn. She knew it was out there. She told me about it. This man was trying to tell me that he believed that his goodness would outweigh his bad deeds. Now, again, later on, a few years, I, that was a different church that I was pastoring. And a few years after I left, he got saved. Thank God. But at the time, that's what he was living by. He did not understand. The day you sin, there are no good deeds. There are no, there is no righteousness left in you. That's, they're, they're undone completely. It's like saying, I just took a bath, I'm clean. And then you go out wallow in the filth again. You're not clean. The moment you get defiled, you're not clean anymore. So that's what Paul is saying here. A man, back in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. And I'll, I, I, let me address Joyce Meyer's doctrine. She said in an interview on Channel 5, after the Post-Dispatch ran a series of articles that did not make her look very good, she said that I am rich, God has blessed me because I deserve it. She says, because I live for God and do all these good things, then God returns wealth and favor unto me. She's, she's lying. Because whatever good works she thinks that she has done, in the day that she transgresses, all of that's gone. All of it is. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, period. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Verse 17. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again, and here it is, here's, and this is what I see happen with people. If I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Now you think about your past the old life. You think about the old you. Does a dog return to its own vomit? Yes. And that's what happens when someone, they make a profession of faith, endure for a while, and then go right back out to the old ways, living the old life, doing the old things, only this time they're in it much worse. 
and it gets much worse on them. Paul said, you're out there building again the things that you destroyed. And he said, you make yourself a transgressor again. For, though, for I, through the law, am dead to the law. And so the, the law then covers the body of this, Paul calls it the body of this death. And I got a sermon this morning. Um, I didn't want to preach it. I thought I would try to change it. And God just kept bringing me back to it. And it's about death. And I, I figured there's probably a good time to preach a sermon like this and a bad time to preach it. So right now we haven't had any deaths in a while. So now would probably be a good time to preach it. And it's about the death of a saint. That's how we're going to heaven, people. It's how we're going. So to have that healthy viewpoint of death, what God, how God then is going to transform us from this world to the next, death is something then, it, number one, it's going to come whether we're ready for it or not. Number two, it's going to happen whether we're saved or not. It's best to, for it to happen when you're right with God than it is when you're lost. Amen? But it's going to happen no matter what. And I'm going to show you that this morning. But this body is under the law as long as it's alive. The moment it's dead... Then, it's no, then you yourself are no longer under the law. You cannot, laws do not apply to dead people. There are no laws in the United States of America that apply to anybody that's dead. Nothing. So that's what he's saying here. Um, verse 19, for, though, for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Now verse 20 is probably a verse you're familiar with. And it's in this context. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So he says, now we have already... It, it's sort of like we understand that we have already been appointed unto death. We have already settled it in our mind that this body is going to die. And, you know, maybe for a while you're afraid of death. And then after a while, you're not afraid of death. Now, I've been through the experience of facing my own death before i was close one day i was as close probably as anybody can come to dying without dying and i've told god numerous times god next time you do this you better do it for real because i don't want to go through that again i don't want to live through it again and number two i don't want to be afraid I don't want to be afraid. And I believe that I won't be. I will never forget Sister Betty when Brother Lee passed away. I'll never forget that day because the hospital called me and said, he's not doing well, come over. So I don't know if you remember this, but you came out and met me in the hall and said, I don't know what you're going to get out of him. He's kind of talking out of his head. If you remember, when I walked in that room, he looked at me and said, hello, Brother Mike. And I talked to him for a little bit. and All of a sudden he stopped and he started praying. So we all prayed. And when he got done, he said, I just wanted to make sure. And God led him to that. There's no doubt in my mind, God. 
And that man died that evening, died in peace. He wasn't afraid. Wasn't afraid. And I have been with saints who maybe they knew they were going to die, maybe they didn't. I remember one guy, he was up at St. Anthony's Hospital. He had had a, he was going to have a cardiac catheter in it that morning because the day before he had a stress test that didn't go well and me and his family is all in his room with him and he's just we're just kind of kidding around trying to lighten up the atmosphere because he was in pretty bad shape and he just out of the blue said I want everybody to know in case anything happens to me I want you to know where I'm going today and that man never made it off the table he died during that cardiac catheter he knew he knew God put it in him. That man had peace in his heart. And that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. When it's my time to die, I do not want to be afraid. And I don't think God will let me be afraid. Okay? And I want you to have that hope. I'm not saying just me. I want each one of us to have that confidence that God you know, he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, when he talks about the day of the Lord, so cometh as a thief in the night. But he said, we're children of the day, so that that day will not overtake us as a thief. And I absolutely believe that. And I've seen it too many times where God's people knew. They may not have been able to say it. They may not have been able to articulate it. But their soul was at peace with God and they knew it. And I believe that. So this is, the, this is what we're talking about. We know that our confidence is never in our flesh and what our deeds have done. I don't remind God how good I've been. Because I know better. I just simply plead unto God. And believe and I trust in God. Him. And this is what I'm referring to. Two religions, do and done, Bible Christianity, and the do religion is witchcraft. Because witchcraft always requires certain rituals, certain words, certain things to be done in a certain way. And we'll get into that a little bit later on. But he said, I'm crucified with Christ. This body, is, count this body is already dead. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live, I live in the flesh by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God. In other words, I don't then, now that I know that my salvation is coming by way of faith, I don't go about trying to establish my own righteousness Thinking that if I do this, then God will see me and God will bless me. I don't frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Why did Christ die on the cross if we can attain righteousness by doing the works of the law? If Christ died for us, it means God sending message to us. You cannot do it for yourself. Nobody ever has, and nobody ever will. So turn to Ephesians 2. Paul backs this up. The Bible backs this up in several places. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. And these are some of the verses that we use with someone who we are either trying to show them the way of salvation, or we're trying to encourage them in the way of salvation after they're already saved. Ephesians 2 verse 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And really, that sums up the whole of the doctrine of salvation. It is by God's grace. Grace is always unmerited favor. It is never earned, ever. It's always just God giving it to you. It's like me giving candy to the kids. Matthew's here this weekend and little Lawson came into my office this morning, so I gave him candy. 
So, just, you know, between, between the assembly and Sunday school, the other grandkids coming in getting candy. Well, here comes Lawson in with his hand out. I already gave you candy. So I gave him another one. He already had a piece. I gave him another one. Why? Because I'm grandpa. And that's what we do. He didn't earn it. I just gave it to him. When we tell the kids before Christmas, if you don't behave, you're not going to get your presents. My mom told us, behave, you won't get your presents. One time mom and dad went out shopping one night, left me and Melissa home. My sister comes to me and says, I know where mom and dad hid the presents. You want to see them? Yeah. So we went and looked at them. Mom come home, knew that they had been moved. I don't know how moms know, but her radar went off, knew. And she came in, looked at both of us, and we're just sitting there guilty. And boy, she was mad. She said, I'm not going to give them to you now. I'm going to take them back to the store. We got them anyway. We got them. Why? You didn't deserve it. Because she's mom. She loved us. She gave it to us. She gave us meals, gave us clothes to wear, bought us stuff for school. Why? Because that's what parents do. They love their children and they do for their children. Even when they grow up, we still do for them. Amen? Still doing for them. That's what we do because we're parents. We're grandparents. We do it because we love them. And that's what grace is. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And man always boasts about his works. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So, now that you are saved, the good works that you did... Were they yours? No. They were God's. They were God's working through us. It was God's idea to have us witness to somebody. Or it was God's idea to have us give something to somebody. Or be nice to someone. Or pray for someone. That was God doing that through us. It still isn't our works. So should we be rewarded for doing things that we didn't really do, that God did through us? No. Then God gets all the praise and the glory and the credit for it. But what he does then is that he shares heaven and then after the thousand year reign of Christ, he's going to share all of the new heaven and new earth with all of his saints. We get the whole of the new creation we get it all and nothing nothing is held back nothing is his workmanship created into christ jesus unto good works turn to romans 4 verse 16 i have that up on the screen therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And I want you to think about it. Before Genesis 17, his name was Abram. In Genesis 17, God gave him a new name, Abraham. A name change is always the token of God's salvation. Then God gives him Isaac, the child of promise. And then in Genesis 22, then he says to Abraham, take thy son, thine only son, to, the, to Mount Moriah, to the place that I will show thee, and offer him there. God already knew what Abraham was going to do. God knew that Abraham was going to believe that God had promised that his seed would continue through Isaac. 
And we know from the scriptures that Abraham was already thinking on his way to Mount Moriah that even if I kill him, God's going to raise him back from the dead and bring my lineage through him because God swore that and I believe what God said. Abraham was prepared to plunge the knife into Isaac's chest. He was prepared to do it. But that's not what God said. God just said, offer him, and that's what Abraham did. But Abraham had already believed that if God, even if he killed him, God was going to raise him back from the dead because his lineage was going to come through Isaac, and he believed what God said. Now, I dare say that any of us has ever been tempted like that or tried or tested like that. But definitely, our faith will always be on trial. Do you believe God? Do you believe what God said? And if you do, that's salvation. So, turn to uh, Romans 5. Next chapter over, verse 2. But whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand... And that's something that Paul says in Galatians uh, 5, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Our ability to stand is by God's grace and not by our own stamina, not by our own works, not by our own strength. I am um, friends with someone who for years, and they were a good Christian, but a few years ago, they went through a really bad time. And I mean a bad time. And it shook them. And in fact, it brought to them the trauma of what they went through. This friend of mine tells me that it weakened his mind. And he has bouts of depression that come over him every now and then. And so, you know, I've been through things like that before. And so he started reaching out to me and I started helping him with how God helps me through it. Because I still get them. I get, I get times where, man, I'm not well at all. This last time going through Lisa's cancer and her surgery put me in a pretty bad, pretty bad place. And this friend of mine, he says, you know, he said, I can, I can see now that before when I was doing things by my own strength, he said, I can see now why God allowed that to happen to me. He said, because I'm finding out that there are people around him that he says, I found out that they also suffer with bouts of depression. And he said, I'm able or better able to help them because I understand what they're going through. He said, I'm far better able to help them than I ever was before. Whereas before, I just thought, eh, they're just going through problems. They should get over it. But he said, now I have compassion on them. I care about them because I know what it's like to go through that. That's grace. Amen. And I've said this for a long time. I don't think God calls us because we're strong. In fact, I don't think he calls strong people at all. He calls the weak. And it's the weak that he uses to bring down the strong. And he calls the foolish because that confounds the wisdom of this world. The scientists of this world would say we're all fools because we believe that in a young earth created 6,000 years ago. And yet we have wisdom that they will never, ever have by the grace of God. Uh, Romans 3. Romans 3.23 is, 
uh, for all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. So Romans 3.26 says, To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus, where is boasting then. And that's what I was saying a while ago about being strong versus being weak. When you're weak, you don't boast. There's nothing to boast about. It wasn't me. That was God doing that. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. So, and that's the two laws. The Old Testament is the law of works. The New Testament is a different law. It's a law of faith. Therefore, verse 28, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So maybe, maybe you're weak with your emotions. Maybe you're weak with fear. Maybe you're weak with lust of the flesh, various lusts of the flesh. Maybe you're weak in that you have lust of the eyes. You weren't saved by that to begin with, but that's what brought you to salvation. And God chose you then because of your weakness. Remember, and I'm going to, we, I don't know who's ringing the bell, but remember when Jacob was wrestling with the Lord. In Ezekiel, no, um, Genesis 32. He's wrestling with the Lord. And they're wrestling all night. And the angel of the Lord, the Lord says, release me. And he says, I'm not going to release you until you bless me. So the Lord reached down and touched his hip and pulled his leg, his hip, out of socket. And it caused Jacob to walk with a limp the rest of his life. But it was only after that that he blessed him. And he said, now your name used to be Jacob, now it's Israel. Because you have wrestled with God and prevailed. And though he limped the rest of his life in weakness, he was blessed by the Lord. Amen? So whatever your weakness is, whatever, wherever your strengths are not, God does that for a reason. He is going to be made strong in that. That way, at the end of your life, you are what I've been saying. You look back and see that it was God doing it and not you. Amen. Father in heaven, we ask your blessings on your word. Thank you, God, because of our weakness. And Father, our weaknesses sometimes we don't share with others. We don't talk about them. We can't. They're ours. But Father, we thank you, God, that through all that weakness, you have always shown yourself and proven yourself to be strong for us. So Father, we thank you for that. We thank you, God, that you've taken the weak of this world and filled us with your grace and your goodness. Bless and honor your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. At perfect timing.